recorded. Uh, the implication of that is that between the webinar being recorded and the PDF that we're going to make available both within the NEMA platform and on Time Looper's website, there's no need to take notes. We encourage you to sort of dive right in and give your full undivided attention to following along with the content journey that we're going to display today. Within the uh, back of its uh, document, there are also a series of links that will direct you to the resources that we're going to talk about. So to the extent that you feel uh, that you're a rather enter uh, enterprising individual and you want to stand the, uh, these virtual tours up yourself, there are all of the resources available for you that we've aggregated in one place in the back. So don't worry about taking notes. Additionally, this is your first time on a Zoom webinar. You will see the Q&A button on the, on the black menu bar. If you have a question, please do not enter it into the chat function. I will find it very difficult to keep track of all of the questions within the hellos and the, ban and the witty banter that you all engage in back and forth. If you do have a question, enter it into the Q&A. Nick and I will do our best to answer your questions at the time that they're asked. However, if the volume of questions becomes so overwhelming, we will defer some of those questions towards the end to ensure that we get through all of the allotted content within the prescribed time frame of the, of the webinar. Uh, I promise you that Nick and I will stay until we answer every single last question, and then also we'll provide our contact information. So if you have follow-up questions later, you can also uh, nag us rather than having us and ask her for our contact information. Um, so without further ado, uh, why don't we jump right in? Um, Again, I am Andrew and this is Nick and we are Time Looper. We are a digital uh, design firm that specializes in the creation and implementation of immersive uh, experiences for museums, historic sites, public lands, uh, cultural institutions of all stripes really. And um, these, um, these experiences are either uh, delivered through our institutional partners on site or through distance-based engagement uh, uh, with their communities. And I suppose that the reason why we're having these webinars is because many people have asked, have been asking us at Time Looper how to stand up these virtual tours in a matter of days, given the environment that we're in. I suppose that uh, it, it, it's, it's not even uh, worth mentioning that COVID has really transformed everybody's life uh, in virtually every facet over the last couple of months. Um, and for cultural institutions, you know, that's no different, you know, and so for many of our, uh, so most of our partners, particularly here on the East Coast, but also across the country, you know, are really being forced to reckon with their doors being closed um, and thinking through how to deploy digital engagement that is compelling um, um, and also doable, given that many of our institutional partners have been a bit reticent to take, to dip this toe in the water in the, uh, in the digital sphere and then also how it can be done uh, at a scalable way and really quickly. Um, you know, there are multiple ways to thinking about developing your digital engagement strategy, and part of it might depend upon how long you think COVID, um, the impacts of COVID will be felt. Uh, we believe that there's both an acute short-term need to be uh, fulfilled within, a, you know, maybe before Labor Day or into the summer, and then there is certainly a longer-term uh, conversation to be had about uh, ensuring institutional resilience and finding uh, ways to digitally convene your community should these issues pop up again, or should you think about expanding your engagement into uh, new realms given, uh, give, given the uh, circumstances that we've all gone through. So today we're going to focus on how to bring your institution into this digital world and connect you with your community, and we're going to do it fo focusing on two form, two methods that you can all take to develop these uh, digital, uh, a digital presence. The first is do it yourself. We are gonna walk you through a host of very simple tools and processes that you can deploy uh, on your own to get your digital footprint up and running literally in 48 hours. Like that is not an exaggeration. You could do it in less if you have all of the equipment and you wanna spend a day rolling up your sleeves. Then we will also pivot to a part of the conversation where we talk about how we are helping all of you. We have heard from so many of our partners that they want to develop these digital footprints, but they are overwhelmed by, uh, by everything that's going on and uh, the lack of financial resources, the inability for their human capital to move around these institutions, lack of familiarity with these technologies. And so many, many of the tools that we're gonna be talking about today, Time Looper is making available to you 
we are building and distributing all of these uh, uh, digital presence building resources for our partners at absolutely no cost for the duration of the COVID crisis. We will get into that a little bit later, but I want to ensure that for those of you who really feel like it's a bridge too far, we are here to help. And for those of you who want to do this on your own, we are also here to help inform your own decision making and hopefully uh, show you a few shortcuts that you can take uh, to develop that digital presence uh, a little bit quicker. So as we move forward, the way that we want to start this presentation today is sort of aligning on uh, definitions. So what is VR and then what it, uh, and, and how does it work? So VR, of course, is virtual reality. And uh, the power of virtual reality is it, it, is it has, is it gives you the ability to completely immerse um, your constituents uh, in your environment from a distance fr from, from, from a remote location. If I'm sitting on my couch, I can deploy virtual reality that you as an institution have created. Um, and then that, uh, that virtual environment can transport me to your museum. It can transport me to your public land. It can transport me to your historic house. Um, and all of a sudden I am completely in an environment that is other than my own. So whereas in other technologies such as you know, traditional digital, whether it's television or, um, or, or navigating the web, you can see and visualize these other environments. Virtual reality is designed to move you from a passive participant, uh, sorry, from a passive viewer into an active participant to put you as a protagonist in the center of that environment. And there are really two ways to do that. If your goal is to show people uh, uh, an, env an environment other than their own, as it looks today, then all you need to do is take a 360 degree, 60 degree photo, video, or even a 3D scan of a present environment. If you want me to see your public land, if you want me to go inside of your historic barn, just like you would do with a regular photo, all you would need to do is utilize a 360 degree camera and capture that environment and then put it onto a, a publishing platform. And then should anybody consume that content, they would immediately be inside of your place, space. However, if you wanna show people a world that is in the future or in the past, if you wanna take people back to the Cretaceous era, if you want people to stand next to George Washington um, you know, uh, during, um, during the revolutionary period, if you want people to see the effects of climate change 100 years from now, you know, no camera, no, uh, no 3D scan of a present day environment would really give people a sufficient sense of place unless that location has been perfectly preserved. In that location, you would need to utilize the development of computer generated imagery, also known as CGI tools, to reconstruct or interpret what those places might look like moving forward. Now, because these are such foundational concepts and they're gonna underpin everything that we're gonna talk about over the next 40 minutes, I'm gonna now ask, I'm gonna now pass the digital microphone over to my colleague, Nick, and he's gonna walk you through a couple of examples of present day virtual immersion and CGI virtual immersion. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's a, a pleasure to meet all of you um, that I haven't met already. I am joining you from my house in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to demonstrate an experience that we built with the National Park Service. But because we're not together physically in the same room, a, mo uh, a moment on usability. So what I'm going to do is pick up my iPad, where I'm joining the Zoom call, share my screen with you, and show you what I'm seeing. I'm going to use my tablet and look around my environment today as such. As I mentioned, I'm here in Washington, DC. Um, I'm presently in Georgetown, but this view, perhaps some of you recognize, as the view from the top of the Washington Monument. In 2012, there was an earthquake here on the, um, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, and the reverberations of that earthquake fractured the top of the monument. The National Park Service asked us to um, capture an experience from the top of the Washington Monument so that all of those tourists and travelers who come to the mall still get a from that particular location. So this, it, this experience 
that you're uh, viewing right now through my tablet is a present day capture. Um, we use a 360 degree camera to capture that view. Now, because we were working with the National Park Service, we decided uh, to take the content one step further. In addition to showing uh, visitors uh, and users what the top of the Washington Monument view looked like, we decided to take them back to different time periods using the historical photographs and topography um, uh, to show them what Washington DC used to look like. In addition to that, using the, the historical archives that the National Park Service had, we've overlaid photographs on key points and locations in the city. Right, so the, the dome of the Capitol that we all recognize from photos and postcards, the Capitol didn't used to have a dome, it was built in 1860, that's a photo of it getting constructed, and so forth. So it started off as a tool for accessibility, and then we used computer generated imagery to extend the layer of, of, of uh, the level of interpretation and turn it into um, an immersive and interactive experience. With that, Andrew, let me pass it back to you. Thanks, Nick. So the power of virtual reality is not just in visualization. If it were, if it were only visualization, that enough would be great, but it's also about the power that, that, that the complete immersion provides. So it's about contextualization and what we like to call meaning. You know, we know that um, people uh, remember 10% of what they hear and 20% of what they read and up to 80% of what they experience. By your putting people into the center of your virtual environment, you're dramatically um, increasing um, the, their ability to retain information because they feel like they're actively participating uh, as, a, you know, as, um, as, as a user inside of your environment rather than passively consuming. Additionally, VR has been called the empathy machine by some of the, the, the most famous VR content film production uh, producers out there. And that's again, because when you're in these environments and you're so intimately up close with protagonists, living historians, et cetera, it really provides a wholly different uh, opportunity uh, for, uh, for emotional connection. The last point that I want to highlight is that it would be great if every single person on the receiving end of VR uh, production was consuming content on a $200 or $1,000 VR headset. The fact that there are $200 Oculus Go headsets out there is wonderful and it has meant a lot for the proliferation of hardware. But most people, as Nick was consuming from, only you know, have a smartphone or they have a tablet device. Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. You, know, you can get really far along in terms of complete immersion with a smartphone or a tablet device and get even really and get even closer to complete immersion if your users have a cardboard virtual reality headset laying around the house that they got from the New York Times or at a local fair. Um, but even without a, a headset, these virtual environments dramatically enhance uh, individuals' uh, connective tissue to your spaces and your experiences. Uh, so now that we've sort of level set on what virtual reality is, we want to give you a couple of uh, tips on content production and content uh, distribution. So on the production side, there are three cameras that we strongly recommend you use should you want to go about capturing 360, right? And it's as simple as searching for any of these on Amazon or on the web, and you can get all of, day, all of them with Prime within the next 48 hours. The Insta360 One X, the Ricoh Theta 5, and the Garmin Verb 360. All of these cameras have the same basic functionality where you turn on the camera, you download the companion application to your smartphone, and then through Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you connect the device to your smartphone. And then your smartphone serves as the shutter release, like in the old days where you would just push the button on the camera, and then you're able to capture all of that content. Then, once you've captured that content, it's really easy to publish. It's as simple as uploading a file like you would to an email by going to YouTube, Facebook, or Vimeo. We really like Facebook 360 in particular because should anybody consume this content that you're publishing on YouTube by, uh, by using the YouTube app on their smartphone, it also has a Google Cardboard sort of mode where all you have to do is turn your uh, device into landscape mode, slide it into a cardboard headset, 
and you as the museum institution don't have to undertake any additional work to facilitate that happening. It's really user friendly. I'm going to show you now a couple of different examples of uh, the kinds of experiences that you can create with three uh, using a basic consumer grade 360 camera, one being three static 360 picture and one being 360 video. The first one I'm going to show you is a 360 picture that you can consume at uh, through Google Arts and Culture. So almost all of your institutions qualify where you could take all of these 360 degree photos and then go to the Google Arts and Culture website and then apply and should they accept and then they'll accept you and then you upload all of this content immediately. These are great tool. This is a great platform to use for your uploading because it's really simple. For those of you who've been to the Guggenheim, you'll recognize this is the top floor. You're on Fifth Avenue at one of the world's premier uh, contemporary art museums. And then the X's that you see in this environment are the points where all of the additional photographs were taken. And by simply clicking on my mouse as a user, I'm now able to move through this virtual environment. So what's great about this is that you as a, as a museum can take a series of photos and then if you want, stitch them together in this sort of platform and then allow people to move through. The downside of this particular platform is that I, as a user, while I live a mile from the Guggenheim, I'm not what you would consider a sophisticated art enthusiast or consumer. I need additional interpretation. So how can I get that additional interpretation without overlaying computer generated graphics or images? Um, one way to do that is to turn this video, this, these photographs into videos and to deploy your docents and your uh, subject matter experts or even your living historians inside of these environments. What I'm going to do now is show you an example from Thomas Edison National Historic Site. So in this example, there's an interpreter from the National Park Service who's standing in the foreground describing the environment and that has the dramatic impact of increasing my understanding of of the actual environment. Hi, welcome to Thomas Edison National Historical Park. I'm glad you can join me here in Edison's library, or some refer to it as his office. He spent a lot of time here in West Orange, arrived here in 1887, spent the rest of his life till he passed away in 1931. He did a lot of work here at his- So all I did there was, was, uh, was click and drag, and you, as the content production studio, only have to take a 360 camera, Locate it in the center of your, your room, and then have your interpreter speak about this experience. One tip, have your interpreter walk around the entire room because the user will naturally gravitate towards the eye of the interpreter. And so as they're walking around the room, they're gonna facilitate full 360 degree consumption. Additionally, try to keep these videos to under two minutes. People today get bored very quickly. And your goal should be to produce compelling content that people can consume in a meaningful fashion um, and that they can consume, uh, di in a, uh, di that they can digest without having to, to go too far. Um, so again, really simple to do. Buy one of these cameras, you need a tripod, sync it up to your uh, iPad, I mean, uh, or your iPhone. Simply, you know, get your head of education, the head of your exhibition, uh, a state or a federal partner interpreter, bring them in and have them describe the environment. Now, how should you think about, you know, the actual interpretive elements inside of your museum environment? For, for many different museums, the interpretation is obviously different. I think the place to start is to think about what the actual underlying programming is that you deliver on site. Meaning, how is it, what is it that you want people to get out of coming to your institution? And then think about how that can be scaled into a virtual environment. And that means something different for everybody else. If you're a public land, you're never gonna be able to provide a, a facsimile experience of people taking a run through your, your, your trails. But you can provide people with the ability to explore the park. If they are endangered species, you can have them get up close and, and personal with the cameras. If you wanna visualize alternate seasons, then you can crowdsource 360 photos or overlay present day, overlay 2D photos on these 360 environments to highlight those contrasts. If you're a historic site, people tend to want to come to learn about history, obviously, to feel the grandeur of what made this place important. And if you have important artifacts, they can actually get up close and personal to those. You can put the camera right next to it. 
it's ironic that in some ways, deploying virtual reality inside of these environments can enhance it accessibility. And that's no more true than if also if you're a zoological institution, right? So if you have animals and you know it's feeding time and they're asleep and the kids are disappointed, well now when your animals are feeding, you know that you can put the camera right next to them. You could also overlay interpretation by helping to facilitate advanced understanding of conservation, animal welfare, et cetera. The, the one overarching sentiment though that I feel like that we've gathered over the last eight weeks of doing these engagements is that everybody is stuck at home and they are so detached from community and culture that they're looking to, for anything. Any per, um, connective tissue that you can provide, people will be immensely grateful for. And so we would encourage you to try. Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Start with something and then gauge the reaction of your community. Get something out there in five to 10 days, see what they have to say, and then use that as the tool to create the next iteration of deploying context and meaning inside of these virtual environments. It can seem like a strange medium if you've only ever interpreted or designed physical installations before, but, it's, but now's the time to try. So if you actually also want to move one step further and enhance engagement and interpretation inside of these environments, there are a couple of other things that you can do. So if it's a 360 degree photo, you can facilitate interaction inside of these environments by creating elements or objects that people can engage with themselves. The power of doing this is that it takes people again from being passive to active, which dramatically increases their, um, their, their, their retention. And then additionally, you can also deploy 360 video as a 360 movie. So rather than just showing an interpreter, if your site has living historians, place those living historians inside of that historic site and reenact a key moment from history. Then you're basically turning your 360 camera and your site into a dramatic studio set and you're producing a film. That's a great way to get people excited. Um, so I'm now gonna pass it back to Nick so he can give you an example of what interactivity looks like inside of a static 360 environment and then he'll also show you how to deploy living historians as well. Thank you, Andrew. I am going to share my screen with everyone again. This time, I'm gonna take us to uh, the other coast. We're gonna go from uh, my house in Washington, DC to uh, the West Coast, to our partners at East Bay Regional Park District. So here, you'll you might recognize this is East Bay Regional Park um, just outside of San Francisco. It's a present day image that rangers took using their Garmin camera on site. This was uh, initially designed for accessibility. You'll notice that we're on a uh, high peak on one of their hillsides. Um, some of their elderly visitors or handicapped visitors wouldn't be able to come to this vantage point and enjoy the view. Um, so that was the impetus for the creation of the content. Then we said, well, let's take what we have, this existing Pleasanton Ridge photo, Regional Park's open space protects land that is vital for the plants and animals who and make a home on these hillsides. Bountiful wildflowers can be found here in springtime, while bobcats, coyotes, so hawks, and eagles um, roam the land year-round. This is a California newt. These adorable amphibians make their way to the ancestral area, breeding ponds, uh, like this one, each winter. Could be, uh, During the hot, dry the California process, summers, uh, they stay seven. underground this waiting for the rain to come. For to Once the first storms arrive, these hardy hikers I'm will travel take up. us inside now and head back to the East Coast, where we're going to look at another project that we did in Washington, D.C. Um, with Ford's Theater. So I'm sure as many of you know, Ford's Theater uh, is uh, the location of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln was shot, he was taken across the street to the Peterson House. So this is the historic home that he was brought to directly afterwards. Um, this is a view from inside one of the rooms. What we've done here is we used um, some of the content that the National Park had to uh, embed voices after the president died, Dr. Gurley went to Mrs. Lincoln and told her, The president is dead. Oh, why did you not let me know? Why did you not tell me? 
your friends thought it was not best. So these are all individuals who are actually in the room at the time of um, Abraham Lincoln's death. So you learn about the moment and we build on the present view from their perspective. With that, I will pass the digital mic back to you. Wait, Andrew. can you show Federal Hall real quick? Ah, sure, yes. Um, so in addition to those two experiences, now there's uh, one more piece of content I'd like to share with you. This is a different sort of experience. So in the last two, we've used um, present, day, uh, present day photos and built on top of them. In this experience, we're gonna head up from DC to New York City to Federal Hall. Uh, Federal Hall is located right outside of the New York Stock Exchange. When tourists come to Federal Hall today, um, they generally go to see the New York Stock Exchange um, and to take pictures with the bulls. They don't notice that the structure directly opposite from them um, was a, is a memorial to commemorate the inauguration of uh, the first president of the United States. So this is New York City today. It has been such an exciting spring. Our new nation's first electoral college has selected Revolutionary War General George Washington to be its first president. Rumor and notice of our war heroes pending arrival. So this is an example of taking present day 360 degree photo um, and then with sophisticated post-production work, creating an environment that doesn't exist. Thanks, Nick. With that, back to you, Andrew. Thank you, buddy. I will say that, again, with regards to that last experience, right, if you have an environment that is preserved, then you don't need to recreate that CGI in, uh, perspective. You can still use your living historians and recreate a moment like that really powerfully uh, to give people that, you know, that immersive moment in time. Uh, going also back to the, the, um, the, the piece from uh, the Peterson House, you know, you have access to all of these primary sources. So just because a primary source is written doesn't mean that we can't turn it into an audio format uh, and use it as a voiceover which sort of, uh, which b before I move on, I'll also just highlight, for those of you who think you wanna create these interactives by yourself, um, we really like Pano2 VR. It's our favorite uh, licensing program. I think they charge $200 a month, which is not cheap, but you can see here, you can take these 360 degree photos yourself and, uh, and then create or facilitate these interactions just like we showed you inside of the Peterson House. If you want, as I mentioned earlier, we're also happy to do it for you at no charge. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about fighting with software. The choice is yours. Um, so with regards to developing um, you know, these interactive experiences like the Peterson House, you already have the content. Now's not necessarily the time to think about creating a new uh, interpretive strategy. So we would really encourage you to think about what you already have off the shelf. What is it that you can quickly deploy? Here's an example from the Henry Ford in Michigan where they have a scavenger hunt. And what they wanted to do was take that scavenger hunt and embed it inside of a 360 degree environment where they ask people to look for specific pieces of uh, content or objects, right? In this case, all they did was translate what they give out to students on paper and convert it into that digital environment. We would encourage you to do the same. And one way to, again, to think about that is to think about, start from your positions of strength. So your existing interpretive guides and lesson plans are probably what's most relevant to your community, which means it will also have the highest use case. Start from that and then think about how to translate that into these digital interactives. Um, one of the other things that uh, is worth thinking about though is that all of these individual experiences that we've been showing are just that. They're individually contained immersive experiences that lack context. Oftentimes what happens is, especially if you're a historic site or a large public land, you wanna provide people with a larger visual context around your place, right? Because in, in many instances, the physical landscape helps shape history, whether that's natural history, cultural history, civics, et cetera. 
And so what you want to be able to do is to uh, place uh, these experiences in relation to each other, to provide a sense of relativism. And the other thing is, then you really also want to be able to give people the ability not just to see and interact with your institution or your space, but what if they could actually walk through it? What if they could literally move through your institution as if they were there today? So part of what we're offering to do, and this is not something that you could necessarily do on your own, but for all of you who want to work with Time Looper through what we're calling our foundations program, you know, we are building all of these augmented reality platform maps of your institution so that people can move through them and then engage with these individual pieces of content. So I'm now going to pass it back to Nick and Nick is going to show you an example of what one of these explore products looks like for a particular institution. Thank you, Andrew. So for this experience, we are going to um, we're going to use augmented reality. This is also um, uh, an experience or an example of something that we've created with our partners at East Bay Regional Park District with our Explore technology. Um, so for this experience, we're going to use the camera feed from my device. So I'm going to say OK. Now, this is picking up my guest room. I'm going to launch an augmented reality map here on my floor, size it, and adjust it to my environment. Now, I can walk around and explore this environment to see what the topography like is what the topography is like within the park system. Then, at certain predetermined locations, I can actually step inside of the content. So here we are at one of the parks in the East Bay Regional Ecosystem. I tap my tablet to the pin, and all of a sudden I can dive deeper into this environment. Um, so all of these experiences were created with content that East Bay Regional Park District already has. Here we are at the frog ponds. These ponds were built to capture water voice in over like it is today. This allows native amphibians like newts and chorus frogs to breed, but prevents invasive bullfrogs from breeding since their tadpoles require two years. Any resources that you already have, Time Looper can take and utilize in this environment. We'll look at one more. Here's another view of our study pond. You can see the water is murky from tannins leached out so of the many leaves Ranger that fall into the pond. Context to us Despite in this appearing dirty, this pond is home for many different aquatic organisms. I can take this environment and make it very big or very large. If I was in my backyard, I could make this environment so big that I could actually traverse and walk around the physical landscape to explore it. Andrew in a moment is going to talk a bit more about how we create these experiences for partners, um, but we encourage you to, to view this through the lens of what we've created with East Bay Regional Park District, but this map or this environment that we're exploring today could be anything. It could be an interpretive map, it could be wayfinding signage, it could be a three-dimensional model of your historic home, et cetera. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nick. Um, so, as Nick was saying, um, so as Nick was saying, it could be anything, right? So Nick showed you a GIS layer, and that might be great if you are a uh, if you are a preservation area, something like that. But you know, also think about if you're a historic site as well, and you don't have a 3D model interpretive maps. So an interpretive map could mean the map that you distribute as a brochure when people come to your institution. It could also be a historic map. Maybe it's a Sandborn, you know, uh, fire insurance map from the mid to late 19th century. Maybe it's one of the first maps that was created in the revolutionary era of your uh, revolutionary town in Massachusetts. You know, you could make that the platform. And then as people are walking across this virtual environment, they would then be triggering all of those uh, different pieces of content. And as Nick was saying, it's scalable, right? So this is how it could actually look in real life. This really gives people the sense of place and it also allows them to walk through your institution. 
Now, this is not just a trick, right, to be used now. Um, and I don't, and, and I say trick pejoratively, right? Like this has meaningful interpretive impact for people because it really helps drive that sense of place. But beyond the immediacy, the, the immediate need of getting this content to people in homes, this now also allows you to facilitate VR conferencing um, and open up your institution through distance-based learning with tools in a way that's never before been possible. You know, this product that Nick just showed you on Zoom is also uh, easily integrated into Skype, Google Hangouts, et cetera. And then all you have to do is facilitate these virtual tours with student groups like you otherwise might already do, and then allow them to walk through your topography. So if you were to expect 5,000 students in the month of May, you know, we can get this product built in under a week, and then in the month of May, you can reach out to all those schools that were gonna come for those virtual field trips. And you could say to the teacher, let me join your students on Google Hangout, and then I will take them on that virtual tr field trip because they can't come today. So this is the kind of product that will have a lot of value moving forward. And it really does take a matter of days to get these things built. So all we need to do are, the first thing we would need to do is understand the platform. Is it a GIS layer? or is it gonna be an interpretive visual that you're gonna to provide to us? And then we take the interpretive content that you send to us, we, we build it and, and locate it onto this augmented map, and then we launch it into the App Store. And it's launched into the App Store as your custom branded institutional application. So if you have no digital footprint, if you don't have an app, if you don't know how to do it, you, know, you could literally have something up in five days that's incredibly immersive and you could have it done for free. Very simple to do. So once you get it built though, it's not enough to say, okay, that's great, my job is done, right? As they say in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. That's not effective marketing. Once you have these assets built, whether you're putting them on YouTube 360, on um, Google Arts and Culture, if you're launching your AR map with Time Looper or using the other Time Looper platforms that are available to you, you need to push this content out to your community to make them know that it's there. So think about where you tend to engage your community whether it's on the website, whether it's on social media, whether it's through you know, direct outreach to schools or donor newsletters, um, whatever those channels are, you need to push this out and make them aware of its existence. If you don't do that, nobody will use it. If you do it and you do it mindfully, and I define mindfully as, if you have a specific community that you know has a need that you tend to typically fill, that they are unable to, that you're unable to fulfill in this environment, that should drive your content development strategy. Then you've built this content by yourself or with Time Looper, and now it's incredibly valuable to this community that otherwise would have been engaging with you in other means. Push this out to them through those existing channels that you have with them, and they're gonna eat it up. Um, so with that, I want, we wanna save a few minutes uh, for questions and answers, but there are uh, Q&A, but there are just a couple of other things that we wanna to touch on. The first of which is, if you want to work with Time Looper, we're supporting all of you by offering all of this for free. So the content development, the content deployment, the app platform, um, the walkable map, the integration into all of these technologies, it's completely free. Reach out, let us know what your museum or institution's about, we're happy to help. If you wanna do it yourself, that's great as well. Call us or email me if you have questions about how to upload to YouTube 360. We are making all of these resources and links also available through, uh, the Time Looper website, and also through uh, the resource board that Scarlett's going to upload onto. Um, and so you should be able to get access to all of this stuff quite, quite easily. Um, for example, if you go to the, uh, to the Time Looper webpage, you'll simply see the webinars tab. And then in a couple of hours, you'll just scroll down and you'll see the webinars archive and this, and this entire step-by-step -step guide on how you can develop your own uh, virtual presence, your virtual tour will be there, uh, as well as the, do the link to the PDF. And then if you want more information about what it is that we're offering for free through what we're calling the Time Looper Foundations program, here's all of the information on that as well. So with that, we've got about 15 minutes. Uh, we finished on time, which is a minor miracle. No technical hiccups today. So Nick and I are happy to take any questions you have about developing your own tours or working with Time Looper. Nick, maybe you want to answer this question. Um, how can I use my, can I use my Android 360 
phone capacity capability instead of purchasing a, six, a 360 camera? Can I use the Pano feature? Mm -hmm. So the Pano feature, um, I actually, I'm, uh, I haven't used the Android 360 photo feature. The panoramic view feature on iPhone, unfortunately, um, can be used as an asset within the experience, but it's, it won't render a true 360 degree photo of the quality that we would recommend. Um, you could use it, you know, again, in lieu of a, uh, of a two dimensional image. Um, but the cameras that, uh, that Andrew and I highlighted today, there were three of them. I think the cheapest is the Ricoh Theta at maybe $200 and then the Garmin Verb is at the higher end at 700. Um, so they're, they're, um, very attainable, um, uh, even for some smaller institutions. And if not, what we found is, um, often um, organizations will buy one and then use it together, number one, or two even, depending on where you are in your institution. Um, now 360 degree pho photography um, is becoming uh, uh, more popular, more ubiquitous in the market. And you might even be able to reach out to your community and find people that have taken 360 degree photos uh, with their own cameras for your institution. Um, and our experience with, uh, with different partners has been people are generally pretty willing to share those and make them accessible to you. Yeah, and there's one other thing that we failed to mention, which is if you don't have a 360 camera, we've actually designed this program for you. So if you think about the, uh, the restrictions that are in place right now, you know, part of the remit that was given to us by all of our partners like you is it's got to be fast. It's got to be free. And it's got to be something that we can deploy that conveys meaning and has impact with the existing assets that we have. I can't get into my museum to take 360 photos. I can't get into my historic house. I can't afford a 360 camera. The, point, the benefit of the, um, the map platform is that the map in and of itself provides so much uh, immersive power and so much uh, interpretive value that you can then overlay your existing interpretive assets on it today and then modify that in the future. If you have a 10 minute video that's inside of your institution, that's a welcome video, cut that down to 90 seconds and create that as a point of interest. If you have an interpretive panel that really powerfully demonstrates a key point, send us the, the JPEG of that or the PDF of that, and then we can overlay the voiceover that you create by recording into your phone, and then it's an interactive point of interest. Over time, as you identify grant funding, as you, uh, you know, develop more comfort and sophistication with 360 cameras, you can enhance and build on this platform and then even utilize CGI. So imagine your uh, historic battlefield, right? Let's say you are Lexington and Concord um, and you're the National Park Service. You could start by, you know, taking a 90 second video clip that's inside of your institution and pegging it to a key point on the battlefield. But then a year from now, when you get a grant from a funder, you can then actually take that map, form, map platform itself and turn it into a CGI environment where you see arrows and troop movements unfold right before your eyes. So while it would be great to have access to 360 photos and 360 cameras, you have this and you have the uh, assets for your institution. So just use that. And the question that we just got that follows up is, as a site that frequently changes exhibits, is it easy to update content and to archive the previous exhibits to still be accessible to the visitors? The answer to that question, Nikki, great question, is absolutely. So Nick showed you three different uh, layers to that map platform, right? So one way to think about it is to offer different exhibitions. So you could, in your same, on your same platform, you could add many different layers. One could be about ecology. One could be about uh, farming techniques. One could be about an endangered species all over the same platform. You can swap them in and out. You can layer them on top of each other. Um, but again, that's something that, that, Nikki, I would recommend you sort of think about that long term, but start immediately with one. And then of course, in three weeks or a month, if you have the emotional and, um, and literal capacity to build these things, then you're actually giving people additional reasons to come back and revisit your app, right? It's like the opposite of Netflix, where every week there's a new TV show on, like when we were kids, where it's appointment viewing. If you're pushing out new content every two weeks, every month, you're going to continue to strengthen that connective tissue with your community. 
Uh, Nick, can you take this next question? After COVID and the foundation's program ends, is there a monthly fee? And how do we, and I'll just add here, how do we know when COVID ends? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the very short answer is yes. Um, there is a fee typically for our services that we offer. Um, when we're working with different partners, we build experiences. There are costs associated with maintaining and hosting those experiences. The cost typically in a normal world is $3.99 per month. And those cover all of the server costs that we have to host the content, all the platform maintenance. So when Amazon or Apple update their software, um, we have to do things on the back end to make sure that that experience still works for visitors and for, for users. Um, so there is typically a cost. Now, during this period, we as a firm generally charge for consultation, for content design, for software design and build, and then uh, maintenance and hosting. Um, so of those four categories of costs, all of them are covered during this period. Um, to, to Andrew's question, when does this period end or how do we know it's over? Um, the answer is we don't. Um, and we, uh, we just, we hope that you guys uh, work with us to collectively figure that out. So when July 1 hits, say, there's not all of a sudden going to be a fee of three ninety nine, right? We can uh, work together dynamically to to work towards this moving target. Um, and for many of our institutions, they come to us and they say, "Look, we love we loved working with you guys. We want to keep going, um, mm -hmm. but we're not sure how we're going to fund this month, this next month." And we'll say, "Don't worry about it. We'll take care of this month, and then maybe there's a grant that we can apply for collectively together um, and pay a pay a one fixed fee to cover the next two years of hosting." Um, uh, through that end. Thanks, Nick. Um, um, Nick, the, here's a follow-up question. Do you have any experience with how, if others have been able to get income charged for a fee with this type of program, maybe charging for ads or something, Nick? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so monetizing the content. A lot of um, our partners uh, provide these experiences to all of their members or all of their potential visitors for free. Some want to use it uh, to monetize or to generate revenue. And there are a few different ways we can do that. One, we can charge for the experience, right? So you promote the experience to all of your members. Um, if you want to, uh, to engage in this pioneering medium, it's a fixed cost for app download. So that's number one. Two, when things return to normal, a lot of our partners monetize these sorts of experiences in the traditional fashion. So take audio guides. Every ticketed customer comes into your historic house or your park, uh, they pay a fee to enter, or maybe entry is free, but they have the opportunity to top up and purchase uh, an additional experience. Um, the two ways we do that today are again through the media guide example. Um, you get a device or you get access to content through QR codes, you purchase that and you can consume additional experiences that complement your visitation. The second, um, uh, with our partners at Pearl Harbor, they have a virtual theater. So many institutions will have orientation videos that you consume when you come. If you purchase this top-up experience, you can sit in a virtual theater and you're placed um, on the USS Arizona at the beginning of Pearl Harbor um, when the Japanese planes were coming in and began bombing. Right, so there are many different ways that we can monetize through app, um, uh, through app purchase, uh, through top up, um, and then the, the third one is actually in the education space. Some of our partners license this content out to different institutions. So in Europe, we work with um, a company called Editorial Planeta. Um, anyone who buys their books on world history can have the option to have access to this content. So these were partners who. Um, built these experiences, we're delivering them free to their visitors, but thought, hey, how else can I use these sort of experiences in, a, in a, um, uh, an incremental way to help fund other projects that I'd like? There's one other way. That is, if you typically charge school groups for visiting your institution, you can take this, as I was discussing, as a facilitated conversation with those schools over Zoom or Skype in the classroom or Google Hangout. Uh, Google Classroom, and then charge them $25, $50, $100 as well. Um, next question. I did a VR of our exhibition with Google Maps 360 using an iPad, and no matter how many times I took the photos, the environment looked uneven and sliced up. Is Google Maps 360 not a good app to use for VR? 
how can I stop this from happening? Only use a 360 camera? Catherine, the simple answer to that question is you got to use a 360 camera if you want a good 360 photo. Otherwise, what you're basically doing is you're taking lots of photos with your iPad and then you're asking Google software to stick those different photos together and create a 360 experience. And no matter how many times you try to do it, as you've experienced, it's not gonna look great. Um, next question, any examples with user-generated content? Alexandra, I assume you mean user-generated by the institution itself. All of the content that Nick showed you from the AR platform from East Bay Regional Parks was created by that institution. We did not create any of that content. Um, and if you want to play with that content more, just download the East Bay Parks Virtual Tour app from the, the iTunes store, um, and then you can consume that content as well. Oh, he mean, oh, you, you think visitor content. Um, we don't have any examples of user-generated content, but one of the things that we've actually, as Nick was mentioning before, you know, 360 photography is an emerging medium you can indeed crowdsource 360 photos or other assets from your community if you know that they're active uh, in taking photos and engaging. Uh, but we don't have any to share with you right now. All right, any other questions? Going once. Going twice. Okay, so before I pass it back to Scarlett, um, obviously we would love to thank all of you for your time today. Wish, uh, wish you all the best of luck during these very challenging times. Um, all of these resources, including these links, will be up on the Time Looper website in a couple of hours. And additionally, uh, the video recording of this webinar will also be posted on the Time Looper website. And I know that Scarlett's gonna do the same. I will now pass the mic back to Scarlett and uh, allow her to say a few words. Thank you, Nick and Andrew, so much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, like Andrew mentioned, we're going to be having this webinar online. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please feel free to email me. If you have any questions, feel free to email myself or Andrew or Nick. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.